Do you know what is one thing that is preventing an all-out war between the US and Russia over Ukraine? Nuclear threshold, maybe. Space technological ambiguity, certainly. The ambiguity surrounding space technology makes it difficult to assess the true capabilities of the United States and Russia. This ambiguity creates uncertainty and fear, which can lead to miscalculation and conflict, thereby holding the US and Russia back. Interestingly, China is also actively vying for such ambiguity with its top secret space program, while India races to catch up, further adding to the evolving dynamics. Competition, cooperation and conflict are all fundamental principles of life on planet Earth. They're all essential for the survival and evolution of species. However, it is important to remember that these principles are not mutually exclusive. For example, in coral reefs, fishes compete for food and space. However, the very same fishes also cooperate to defend themselves from predators. While some coral reef fishes will form schools, which makes it more difficult for predators to target them, other coral reef fishes will produce chemicals that deter predators. The balance between competition, cooperation and conflict is essential for the health of ecosystems. When the balance is upset, it can lead to the extinction of species or the collapse of ecosystems. Similarly, it is important to remember that competition, cooperation and conflict are all part of the evolution of space technology and exploration. These principles are essential for the advancement of the space industry, but they can also lead to serious conflicts and potential wars. It is important to find ways to balance these principles so that humanity can safely and sustainably move onto the space age. So as the mad race for dominance in space accelerates and India makes a bang with Chandrayaan-3, let's build upon our understanding of the fundamentals of space. As they say, is the final frontier. Dear viewers, I'm Lipakshi Kurana from Study IQIS and you are about to embark on a journey of learning like no other. So sit back, grab a pen and paper and get ready to be inspired. Let's begin by examining the fundamental terminology that defines the concept of space. Space technically stands above the Karman line, 100 kilometers above our heads. So what is Karman line? The Karman line is an imaginary boundary between Earth's atmosphere and outer space. It's widely accepted that the Karman line rests at a distance of 100 kilometers above mean sea level. However, it's important to note that the Karman line is not a physical barrier, but rather a critical point. Beyond this point, the atmosphere becomes extremely thin. So thin, in fact, that conventional aircraft can't generate enough aerodynamic lift to stay airborne. Above the Karman line, objects must travel at an orbital velocity in order to maintain their altitude. Interestingly, the International Space Station orbits Earth at an altitude of around 400 kilometers, well above the Karman line. But then there are thousands of satellites occupying various orbits each serving a different purpose. So friends, these satellites play vital roles, contributing to weather prediction, television broadcast, navigation assistance and global communication. So let's explore. In which multiple orbits around Earth do these satellites orbit? So let's start by first delving into low Earth orbit, often abbreviated as LEO. So low Earth orbit refers to an orbit around our planet at an altitude of less than 1,000 kilometers. This type of orbit is immensely popular and serves as the chosen path for countless artificial satellites. One significant application is Earth observation. Satellites in LEO capture high-resolution images of the Earth's surface. These images are indispensable for activities like mapping, weather prediction and rapid disaster response. LEO satellites also work as communication nodes, providing essential services like mobile phone connectivity and internet access. Beyond that, they contribute extensively to scientific research. Studying the atmosphere, oceans and Earth's magnetic field is made possible by these scientific satellites in LEO. Well, friends, in the realm of defense, LEO satellites offer a range of military applications. 
from surveillance and navigation to precision targeting, they play a crucial role. However, there are certain challenges as well. LEO satellites grapple with atmospheric drag, requiring occasional altitude boost to maintain orbit. They are also more exposed to solar radiation as well as cosmic radiation on the count of high energy particles such as protons and neutrons interacting with Earth's magnetic field. Satellites in LEO are harder to surface and repair compared to those in higher orbits because they travel faster and are difficult to catch. Capturing and servicing LEO satellites can slow them down and make them fall out of the orbit so they need to be boosted back to their original orbit. Friends, further, they are more exposed to space debris as there are millions of pieces of space debris orbiting the Earth. The debris can travel at speeds of up to 28,000 km per hour. However, several well-known satellites reside in LEO. This includes International Space Station, the Hubble Space Telescope, the GPS constellation, Iridium, as well as the Starlink constellation. Well, friends, now let's delve into medium Earth orbit, commonly known as MEO. Medium Earth orbit revolves around Earth at an altitude ranging from 1,000 to 35,786 kilometers. It's a good compromise between the low Earth orbit, that is LEO, and the geostationary orbit, that is GEO. MEO satellites have a longer orbital period than LEO satellites, but they are less susceptible to atmospheric drag and radiation than GEO satellites. This makes them ideal for a variety of applications. First up, navigation. MEO satellites form the backbone of the global navigation satellite system, better known as GNSS. This global system facilitates navigation services for aeroplanes, ships and cars. Secondly, communication. MEO satellites are used to provide communication services for a variety of purposes such as broadcasting, telecommunications and military communications. Thirdly, it is Earth observation. MEO satellites can be used to provide high-resolution images of Earth's surface which are used for a variety of purposes such as mapping, weather forecasting and disaster response. Fourthly is scientific research. MEO satellites can be used to conduct scientific research such as studying the atmosphere, the oceans and the Earth's magnetic field. But as with any orbit, there are challenges with MEO. Well friends, MEO satellites have a longer orbital period than LEO satellites which means they take longer to update data. They are more susceptible to interference from other satellites in the same orbit. MEO satellites are more difficult to service and repair than satellites in LEO. However, there are several well-known satellites that reside in MEO. This includes the GPS constellation, GLONASS, Galileo, BIDO and the Iridium constellation. Now let's venture into the realm of high Earth orbit, commonly referred to as HEO. High Earth orbit encircles Earth at altitudes surpassing 35,786 kilometers. It is the highest type of orbit for artificial satellites and serves as a foundation for diverse objectives. Scientific exploration thrives in HEO. From studying the atmosphere and the oceans to the Earth's magnetic field, HEO satellites advance our understanding. Well, friends, equipped with the ability to offer a continuous view of the Earth's surface, they become invaluable tools for military functions such as surveillance, navigation and targeting. HEO satellites can also be used to support space exploration missions such as providing communication and navigation services to spacecraft. However, there are challenges when it comes to HEO. HEO satellites are more expensive to launch than satellites in lower orbits. These satellites have a longer orbital period than satellites in lower orbits which means they take longer to update the data. HEO satellites are more difficult to service and repair than satellites in lower orbits. There are several well-known satellites that reside in HEO. Radio Astron, it is a Russian space telescope that uses a HEO to study radio waves from distant objects in space. Next is Deep Space Network, DSN. The DSN is a network of radio antennas that are used to communicate with spacecraft in deep space. The DSN's antennas are in HEO to provide uninterrupted coverage of the sky. 
Next is Gravity Probe B. It was a NASA satellite that used a HEO to test Einstein's theory of general relativity. Wind is next. Wind is a NASA satellite that uses an HEO to study the solar wind. Next up is Stereo. It is a NASA mission that uses two satellites in HEO to study the sun and its influence on the solar system. Well, next is Geosynchronous Earth Orbit. A geosynchronous Earth orbit, GEO, is a circular orbit in the Earth's equatorial plane at an altitude of approximately 35,786 kilometers. A satellite in a geosynchronous orbit has a period of 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.09 seconds, which is the same as the Earth's rotational period. This means that a satellite in a geosynchronous orbit appears to be stationary above the same point on the Earth's surface. Well, friends, interestingly, GEO is different from HEO in terms of orbital configurations that vary in altitude, orbital period, and stationary behavior over the Earth's surface. Geosynchronous orbits are a valuable asset for a variety of other applications. They provide a stable platform for communication, navigation, Earth observation, and military purposes. Geosynchronous orbits are used for a variety of applications. Firstly, communications. Geosynchronous satellites are used for communications such as television, radio, and the internet. This is because they can provide a continuous signal to a fixed point on the Earth. Secondly, it is navigation. Geosynchronous satellites are used for navigation such as GPS. This is because they can provide a precise position fixed to a receiver on the Earth. Thirdly, it is Earth observation. Geosynchronous satellites are used for Earth observation such as weather forecasting and disaster monitoring. This is because they can provide a wide view of the Earth's surface. Fourthly, it is military. Geosynchronous satellites are used for military purposes such as missile tracking and surveillance. This is because they can provide a global view of the Earth. However, there are some of the disadvantages of geosynchronous orbits as well. Firstly, it has a very high cost. Geosynchronous satellites are expensive to launch and maintain. Secondly, they have a high latency. The signal from a geosynchronous satellite has to travel a long distance to reach the Earth. This can cause a delay in the signal, which is not ideal for some applications such as real-time communication. Fourthly, it is space debris. There is a lot of space debris in geosynchronous orbit. This can pose a risk to satellites in this orbit. So friends, historically, whenever humans have explored what they thought was uncharted territory, war and conflict have not been far behind. So what could the role of space be in any future war? Space is big. The volume of space between Leo and Geo is 190 times bigger than the volume of Earth. Furthermore, because a satellite is moving quickly, it has a lot of inertia. Consequently, changing or repositioning a satellite in its orbit, known as a maneuver, can require significant time and energy. Maneuvering a satellite in space is very different from maneuvering an airplane or other earthbound vehicle. Think of it like the maneuvering of a train, which is only free to move in the one direction defined by its tracks. Because the way things move in space is not instinctive to most of us, it is important to take the time to understand what makes space unique in terms of the possibility of space-to-space -space conflict. There are five key principles that govern space engagement. First, satellites move quickly. Secondly, satellites move predictably. Thirdly, space is big. Fourthly, timing is everything. Fifthly, satellites maneuver slowly. Now, because the fuel required to maneuver a satellite is limited and communication with the satellite is time-consuming, so the possibility of space-to-space -space conflict in space is uniquely limited. So friends, it is for this reason that we are witnessing a mad race for developing alternative weapon systems like ground-based anti-satellite missiles, electronic warfare, directed energy weapons, and cyber capabilities to gain a strategic edge. These alternatives to space-bound weapons could shorten attack timelines and increase the number of targets that can be attacked in short order. Well, friends, to understand it better, let's look at some of the anti-satellite weapons that are being developed. 
first app is kinetic energy weapons. These weapons use the kinetic energy of a projectile to destroy their target. They do not use explosives, relying instead on the sheer force of impact to do their damage. Kinetic energy weapons are very accurate and destructive and they're not affected by gravity or air resistance, making them ideal for use in space. Well, the US kinetic energy weapon system with anti-satellite capabilities is the kinetic energy kill vehicle that is KEKV. The KEKV is a small, maneuverable vehicle that is designed to destroy satellites in low Earth orbit. So the KEKV is launched into space on a rocket and then uses its own propulsion system to maneuver towards its target. Once the KEKV reaches its target, it uses its kinetic energy to destroy it by impact. Well friends, now let's look at the Russian S-500 and PL-19 anti-satellite weapons. S-500 is a surface-to-air missile system that is designed to engage ballistic missiles, hypersonic missiles and satellites. The S-500 has a range of up to 600 kilometers and can reach altitudes of up to 185 kilometers. This makes it capable of engaging satellites in low Earth orbit. The S-500 is not the only anti-satellite weapon that Russia has developed. In 2019, Russia tested a new missile that is designed to destroy satellites in low Earth orbit. This missile, known as the PL-90 Nudol, is said to be capable of hitting satellites at altitudes of up to 1,500 kilometers. Well, the Mission Shakti is an Indian anti-satellite missile test that was conducted in 2019. The test involved the destruction of a low Earth orbit satellite using a kinetic energy weapon. Mission Shakti was the first anti-satellite missile test to be conducted by India. Second in line, there are laser weapons. These weapons use a beam of light to destroy their target. Laser weapons are very accurate and can be used to target a variety of objects, including satellites, missiles and aircraft. However, laser weapons require a lot of power and are not effective in atmospheres with a lot of dust or smoke. China currently has a High Energy Laser Experimental Satellite or HELTS. The HELTS is a Chinese satellite that is equipped with a high energy laser weapon. The HELTS is designed to test the feasibility of using laser weapons to destroy satellites in space. In the case of the US, it is the Laser Weapon System or LAWS. The LAWS is a US Navy laser weapon that is designed to be used against small boats and other surface targets. The LAWS has been deployed on ships and is being tested for use against the satellites. So friends, the Russian laser weapon is Perisvet. It is said to be capable of destroying satellites in low Earth orbit. Not much is known about the Perisvet, but it is believed to be a powerful laser weapon that could be used against the satellites. India's laser weapon with anti-satellite capabilities is the Kali or Kilsat Advanced Laser Weapon System. The Kali is a high-powered laser weapon that is designed to destroy satellites in low Earth orbit. It is still under development, but it is believed to be a very effective anti-satellite weapon. The Kali is mounted on a mobile platform, which allows it to be deployed quickly and easily. Third in line is particle beam weapons. These weapons use a beam of charged particles, such as electrons or protons, to destroy their target. Particle beam weapons are not as powerful as laser weapons, but they're more effective in the atmosphere with a lot of dust or smoke. Particle beam weapons also require less power than laser weapons. The US has developed a weapon called Tactical High Power Microwave or THPM. The THPM weapon is a US military weapon that is designed to disable or destroy electronic systems. Well, this can be used against satellites, but it is not clear how effective it would be. Russia has developed a weapon called Particle Beam Weapon, PBW. The PBW is a Russian particle beam weapon that is still in development. It is designed to destroy satellites and other targets in space. Well, friends, in the case of India, there is no publicly available information that it has particle beam weapons. There are various other kinetic energy anti-satellite weapons as well. A few examples are co-orbital anti-satellite. Co-orbital anti-satellite weapons, the AS-80s, are weapons that are placed into orbit 
and then maneuver close to a target satellite and attack it by various means, including direct collision, fragmentation, or using robotic arms. Next is space mines. Space mines are explosive devices that are placed in space to destroy or disable enemy satellites. They can be placed in orbit around the Earth or in other celestial bodies. Next is Ballistic Missile Defense, the BDM. It could be used to intercept and destroy ballistic missiles in mid-air. This would be a more effective and less expensive way to defend against ballistic missiles than current methods such as the use of interceptor missiles. Next is Orbital Bombardment. It could be used to bombard targets on the ground from the orbit. This would be a more precise and less destructive way to deliver ordnance than traditional bombs or missiles. Next we talk about is anti-satellite warfare. It could be used to destroy enemy satellites. This would disrupt communication, navigation and surveillance systems and it could also be used to create debris fields in space that would pose a hazard to other satellites and spacecraft. So friends, now let's look at the possibility of the use of artificial intelligence in space warfare. The integration of AI into warfare stands as a fundamental detriment of supremacy in the information age. AI has the potential to be used in space warfare in a number of ways. Firstly, it is target identification and tracking. AI can be used to identify and track enemy satellites and other objects in space. This information can be used to plan and execute attacks on enemy assets. Secondly, it is weapon control. AI can be used to control weapons in space such as kinetic energy weapons and laser weapons. This can make weapons more accurate and effective. Thirdly, it is cyber warfare. AI can be used to conduct cyber attacks on enemy satellites and other space assets. This could disrupt enemy communications, navigation and surveillance systems. Fourthly, it is space situational awareness. AI can be used to collect and analyze data from a variety of sources to create a comprehensive picture of the space environment. This information can be used to track enemy assets and identify potential threats. Interestingly, China's unparalleled advancements highlight the urgency and propelling second space race. India cannot settle for catching up. It must instead ensure a technological edge over adept adversaries, ultimately determining its place in the second space race. So in conclusion, we can say that the use of space in the Gulf War was a watershed movement in the history of space warfare. For the first time, satellites were used extensively to gather intelligence, coordinate military operations, and conduct air strikes. This use of space proved to be so effective that it has become a standard practice in modern warfare. The use of space in the Gulf War and the development of AI in space warfare are two important developments that are shaping the future of the space arena. Friends, it is likely that these trends will continue to evolve in the years to come and it is important to be aware of these developments. So friends, in the next episode, we'll discuss the race to conquer the moon and the significance of sovereign space stations. Remember, space is evolving and together we will explore the wonders of it. Till then, stay curious and stay informed. Do like, share and subscribe. See you soon.